in your interventions, there didn't seem to be a focus on exercise. And I guess given the importance of skeletal muscle in glucose homeostasis, I wondered if you'd ever considered um, the inevitable kind of muscle loss that, that comes with losing a significant amount of body weight, particularly if you're not doing resistance training concurrently. Sure. Focusing for a moment on the the loss of muscle mass, uh, this is something we've measured. It was uh, uh, a 4% decrease in uh, uh, fat-free mass of the body in the counterpoint study. So we measured everything in that first study. Now, if I persuaded you to walk around every day wearing uh, a weights vest that contained 15 kilograms of weight, guess what? Your muscle mass would increase by a few percent over eight weeks. If people lose 15 kilograms, the muscle mass has to decrease because every day they're carting around less body. And the muscles we're talking about are the muscles you never think about very much, that the huge muscles maintaining the posture of the lower back and keeping the hips in the right position. Those are the real energy consumers uh, during moving ourselves around our curious race of bipeds. We rely on those muscles and a lot of uh, energy there. So when people are 15 kilograms lighter, there's a physiological reason for them to have less muscle mass. This has been completely misinterpreted as, oh dear, the weight loss causes loss of useful muscle. Well, no, it's not useful muscle. The body decides how much muscle is useful by how much work it has to do every day. You can prevent this using resistance exercise, and that's absolutely right. And I would add that in the Newcastle Magnetic Resonance Centre, we've not just been researching uh, food and diabetes, we also do exercise studies on ordinary people, couch potatoes and athletes. So this is an area that we're really very tuned into. So our studies of resistance exercise show very precisely that uh, that is a very good way of building muscle. Why didn't we use it in counterpoint? Well, the reason relates to one of our exercise studies, which took a group of inactive people and got them to train up, and we made measurements on them throughout this period, so that they could do a half marathon. They all completed the Great North Run. I have to say they didn't all run it. Uh, there was a lot of walking. But they all did it, and moving from their totally sedentary uh, behaviour to doing this was remarkable. What happened to the level of fitness? It went up remarkably. What happened to their weight? It did not change. Now, they had in, in, burnt huge amounts of energy in the training, in the, during the race. Why hadn't it changed? After every research project, we invite back our participants to uh, hear the results. We explain the results for them, what they've gone through all these traumas of measurements for, as well as finding out how it was for them. Because that's how we learn how people can perhaps have studies done in a more tolerable fashion. We learn how, for instance, a diet was affecting people. But in this case... I wanted to hear how it was for these people uh, after all their training. And I said, one of the funny things is, the average weight stayed exactly the same, even though we were burning so much energy, and I don't expect it to drop. And this lady put up her hand and said, you don't understand, Doctor. When you're coming back from your half-hour walk, you've only got one thought in your mind. I deserve that pie. And suddenly, I had a completely different perspective on ordinary people doing much more exercise than usual and the thoughts and behaviour that elucidated. So I went to the literature and found out if there was any basis for this. Yes, compensatory eating uh, after starting an exercise programme is well recognised. This explained why your friends might say to you, hey, I joined that gym, 
I've slobbed my guts out for three months. My weight hasn't changed. It's just not working. I don't know what's going on. Compensatory eating. And so this is why we asked people not to undertake additional exercise during the counterpoint study. And that's gone all the way through. And so in the NHS National Remission Programme, people are not asked to undertake more exercise during the weight loss phase. But let me emphasise a really important point. During the weight maintenance phase, we actively encourage people to increase what they do. If people want to uh, make their neck a bit broader because they might have lost weight there, well, they can do upper body weights. That's very popular with men. So the exercise message is not that you mustn't do it. It's that we must separate in time the matter of weight loss from increased physical activity. That's a very important practical point. And it's one that is so often missed out by exercise enthusiasts who are quite rightly enthusiastic about exercise. But these young trainers think that everybody would respond to exercise as they do as a habitual activity and not actually look at literature and realise that people haven't, who haven't done it before will increase what they eat when they start an exercise program. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. There's a lot in that. I guess one of the things that my head keeps going back to is the etiology of type 2 diabetes and the, the insulin resistance in muscle tissue and uh, I appreciate that you said there that there wasn't a lot of muscle mass lost during the the um, weight loss intervention. But just to kind of maybe push back a tiny bit, I'm not sure if if the average person in the general public with poor metabolic health has a lot of a lot of muscle mass in the first place at baseline. So you know, they're probably already under muscled. And I guess my, my point here is, um, not to question what you're saying about appetite. I hear that. I wonder if over the two year and five years, even if it's outside of the weight loss intervention, I wonder if people have very specific resistance training in place that they might have, there might be, uh, a, a higher rate of remission um, by, by improving someone's ability to, to kind of manage blood glucose by having this, this greater glucose sink, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. I'm completely on, on board with that. Um, and indeed, exercise and specifically walking was actively encouraged, was measured, was mentioned at every follow-up visit. But there's a further aspect we haven't touched on and this is illustrated by what happened when we measured the effect of this exercise advice. So we used accelerometers, accurate triaxial accelerometers fitted on the upper arm uh, to measure uh, physical activity um, during the whole of the direct randomized trial. And what we found was our well-meaning advice to increase more was met with reports of doing more exercise, the objective measurement from the accelerometer showed absolutely no change. Now, you might be very disappointed in that. You think, well, maybe they weren't terribly good at giving the advice. But in fact, the further factor I mentioned was that people who develop type 2 diabetes tend to do less physical activity than the rest of the population. They tend to like activity less whether this is a biological feature or it's merely an additional factor that makes the diabetes more likely, we don't know. But yes, I agree entirely with uh, the point you made, but it has to be set in perspective. And with regard to these people who don't have enormous amounts of muscle, well, in fact, large people have very large muscles. Um, and the muscle that a person has 
reflects their everyday activity. It's whatever they need to do what they do. And these people need less to move around in exactly the same way as it did before. You might say the final arbiter is, well, how do they feel? The quality of life improved in direct, and that remains so, in fact, throughout uh, the five years of the study. Mm-hmm.